Uh, hi, my name is Rupal Gandhi. I am an interventional radiologist at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. I'm here with uh, Dr. Neil Varadia uh, from the Miami VA Medical Center, and we're going to be talking about IVC filters today. Uh, so, Neil, um, the preserved data, you know, it actually showed pretty good outcomes in terms of, you know, low complication rates for IVC filters, and, you know, the PE uh, in that setting was pretty low. Has that changed the way that you approach IVC filters in terms of placement, retrieval, et cetera? Yeah, I think the data um, helped alleviate um, some of our fears in terms of um, long-term um, filter um, complications and, st and things like that. Um, so in terms of my personal practice, it's kind of made me um, just feel better about putting filters in, but overall I still place them when it's medically indicated and then try to get them out as soon as we can. Yeah, I think the same thing for me. You know, I mean, it definitely made us feel a little bit better about it. We definitely place them when they're indicated, but um, I think I think we've seen and demonstrated, you know, through multiple patients and through various filters that it's safe to place them. Uh, the complication rate is very low, although we definitely will make an attempt to get them out as soon as the filter is not indicated anymore. Right. In terms of um, safety and data, is there anything that your practice does that? Uh, Chooses, makes you choose a certain type of filter over the other? Yeah, I think that's a good question. You know, I mean, I think the things that we're always looking for is, you know, how well does the filter work in terms of preventing pulmonary embolism? But beyond that, you know, we're looking at complications as well. You know, what is the incidence of caval thrombosis, DVT, uh, filter migration or embolization, fracture, uh, penetration, et cetera? And we're really looking at all those things kind of together in determining which filter we want to place. On top of that, you know, I think a very important is, you know, even with all those things, we want to make sure we could get the filter out. And I think that's really critical. Yeah, similar for us. It's, um, we look at, you know, the length that it's probably going to stay in, and then um, we want to make sure the filter's safe in terms of those complications. And I think most of them nowadays on the market are pretty well uh, suited to, you know, stay in for a good amount of time, but also, again, trying to get them out as soon as we can. Sure, sure. You know, the recent data states that the Option Elite filter has a low complication rate. Uh, you know, do you find that, you know, is that a compelling feature to utilize the Option Elite? You know, specifically, you know, one of the studies that was looking at almost had almost 400 patients. There was no embolization. There was only one migration. There was two fractures. So, you know, pretty safe. Yeah, I, I like the Option filter. Um, I like it's a single cell, um, you know, design, single piece of metal. Uh, so it reduces those risks. And um, I like the low profile that it has. So. Um, Generally, I do tend to go with the option as like my primary choice, um, and it shows has good data behind it, which I appreciate. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's become really my filter of choice uh, in placing retrievable filters. And one, one of the nice things about it is you can place it over a wire, right. which I think allows it to be a little bit straighter. And I do like the low profile for sure. It's a five French inner diameter, which is the smallest of any filter uh, I believe that's out there. Yeah, and others like safety features as we were discussing, you know, I like the single piece of nitinol um, and the low profile, which is the small sheath, especially if you're working with trainees and, um, you know, other operators, just having a smaller hole is better. It also patients with bleeding risk and, um, you know, makes it much easier to control. Um, also the flexibility of uh, doing different access sites like popliteal um, and or switching between femoral and IJ and just switching the filter around I think is really, um, you know, versatile and helpful. No, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, you know, sometimes we end up, you know, we're putting a filter and patient needs a line as well. Yeah. And with some of the bigger filters, you end up, you know, bleeding around the central line. But having, you know, a five French inner diameter uh, access, then we just basically use that same access for a line. Yeah, you can swap so, it out easily. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and yeah, I think it's the only filter out there which actually has an indication for popliteal access. There's a 70 and 100 centimeter delivery system, 100 centimeter being specifically deliverable from the popliteal access, which, uh, which does make it unique. Going back to the preserved trial, did it uh, affect your retrieval rate at all? I don't think it's really affected our retrieval rate. I think, you know, again, it made me feel safe uh, yeah. that, you know, the filters are generally safe. Yeah, they all have, you know, a finite complication rate. 
Um, but you know, our goal is always to try to get the filter out as soon as it's no longer necessary. And we do have, you know, we have somebody you know in our lab who kind of follows these filters. Although I'm kind of pretty diligent and I try to follow my own filters as well. Yeah, same with us. Like we tr we have a, a tracking mechanism. Obviously, some are lost to follow up, um, especially in some of these trauma cases. But uh, we definitely, again, try to get them out as we can, as soon as we can. You know, our most recent study uh, showed that Option Elite has a 99% retrieval success rate. You know, what's your experience with the retrieval? Yeah, I've never failed with an option retrieval. I've gotten them all out. Um, most of the time, um, with just a simple snare uh, combination, uh, it's rare that I have to go in and use more advanced techniques such as hangman or forceps. Um, so I've gotten all of mine out. Yeah, no, we've had very similar success rates. You know, I think the ones that can be more challenging are the ones that, you know, maybe they, they're placed tilted for whatever reason, or, you know, the, you have the hook kind of embedded in the wall. And, and those are the cases, you know, we always start with initial snare technique as well. And then if that doesn't work, then we'll go to, you know, a hangman or loop snare. If I need to go anything beyond that, typically we go to general anesthesia, and that, at that point we're considering, you know, either endobronchial forceps or laser. Yeah, okay. similar with us. I'll try usually with sedation for um, initial retrieval with a gooseneck or clover leaf snare. Um, and if it seems like it's going to be a more complex case, then I generally bring the patient back um, after a good venogram with anesthesia. Um, but it's again, it's re really rare with the option that I've had to you know resort to those advanced techniques. I think it's just the design of the narrower neck with the hook um, that allows the snares to grab it really easily. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think that's one of the things that really makes the filter easier to retrieve. You know, I think number one, having the single piece of nitinol, yeah. so it's less likely to fracture, yeah. and the open apex design, which prevents it from you know kind of getting mangled when you're when you're snaring it. Yeah, and that single piece really, I think, um, just makes me feel better of like you know, legs not going to get bent off or a small leg um, going to fracture through as you shove the the sheath down. So. Yeah, so the filter has like, good properties, I think, to prevent those uh, complications that we're worried about. Yeah, agreed, agreed. How about, t is there an ideal time when you like to try to take these filters out? Yeah, most of our cases we do three to six months, um, ideally, soon, or you know, again, as soon as they can be on anticoagulation or no longer need it. Um, a lot of our cases are related to, um, most of them are for surgical um, placements for long orthopedic uh, cases. So we usually we can get those out within, a, you know, three months, but I'll take it out earlier. If as soon as they you know, don't need the filter, I try to bring them back to get it out. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty similar philosophy. You know, as soon as the filter is not needed, try to get it out yeah. uh, as quickly as possible. Um, what are some of the more challenging um, uh, cases or examples you faced uh, when trying to remove a filter? Sure. I mean, d definitely, you know, you know, there's a few things, but, you know, one is obviously the hook, you know, yeah. the hook is embedded in the wall. You know, oftentimes we're getting, you know, we're using loop snare or endobronchial forceps. Uh, sometimes you have the device, you know, the, you have penetration and it's really kind of embedded in the wall. And that in that case, we'll use, you know, laser or cava clear uh, to, to take out the filter as well. And finally, you know, we have had some cases where we have caval thrombosis right. and patient, you know, presents symptomatically. And so when, the patient, when the patients don't, don't have a lot of symptoms, typically I'll just in the past, I would just put the patient on anticoagulation, recheck them in a few months. The patient's symptomatic, we got to do something about it. And uh, one of the newer devices is a, an RE Protrieve device, which basically a filter that you could, or a funnel which you could put above the filter, remove the filter, capture any thrombus, and treat the patient as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, some of the, again, challenges that we faced is just the hook has been embedded in the wall or we have a leg perforating out. But again, most of the time I've been able to get them out with. Um, with a hangman technique and some forceps, um, or just w getting the filter freed off the wall and then getting it with the snares. Um, I tend to use larger sheaths. Um, that's been the key t with those cases, is just uh, trying to really get a larger sheath to you know, oppose the wall of the cable a little bit better, um, or fit in the cable a little bit better so you can grab the filter um, easier. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I, after going to, you go starting with the initial, like, you know, clover leaf snare, for yeah. example, if I'm having a hard time, at that point, I just go to a 16 French sheath yeah. and, and, you know, try not, not really messing around beyond that. In these cases that are complicated, are you going in um, with the larger sheath from the beginning or do you, size, do you switch out? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, if, if, the, if, if it's a filter that's been placed in the last three months or maybe even six months, 
No, I'll usually start with the standard, you know, your, your regular, you know, filter retrieval device. But anything beyond that, or if there's something on, the, if I happen to have some imaging which shows penetration, or it's been there for a long time, or anything worrisome, I'll just I'll just start with the 16 French. Yeah. Yourself? Yeah, similar situation. If it's like one of those routine removals, I'll start with the standard 10-12 uh, system, and then if it's if there's any indication it's going to be complicated, I tend to go in with the bigger sheath just from the beginning so it's ready to go and you're not worrying about an exchange. What about, you know, I think when you're placing these filters and when we're placing these filters, you know, I think it's key to, you know, place it well, place the filter. Any, any tips or tricks and, you know, are there any, you know, aspects of this filter itself that, you know, lend it to, you know, better, you know, I guess better centering and ultimately better retrieval? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I generally prefer the groin access um, as a femoral starting point. And you can end up with some tilting um, as, you know, the uh, iliacs go into the IVC, um, dropping the filter in that lower le area. But um, the over-the-wire technique has really helped with that and keeping it straight. Um, I just hate fighting the valve at the, the IVC uh, and through the heart. So... Uh, most of mine generally are femoral, unless there's a femoral DVT or something like that. Um, and then I like to land mine maybe a centimeter bel below the renal veins just to make the retrieval easier. I found that if it's right at the renal veins, um, your retrieval sheath kind of keeps going into the renal, so it makes it a little difficult. So I tend to land it in that straight segment of IVC, um, which I know has some risk of like more thrombosis with the inflow, but... Um, I think it just makes the retrievals easier, especially for these surgical cases where I think they're going to come out fairly soon. Yeah, you know, my, my approach is a little bit different, but I, yeah. I, these are just, you know, things of different operators. You know, yeah. I, I, probably 99% of the filters I place, I'll put them through the internal jugular vein. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, just, you know, personal preference more than anything else. The other thing, you know, we train, you know, residents and fellows, and one of the things I do tell them is, you know, don't do it too slowly. You know, I, to, well, I mean, don't go super fast, but deploy relatively fast, and the device tends to land very straight. So that certainly over the wire technique allows it to land even straighter. Um, and in terms of, you know, where the filter, I, I typically try to get it at the renal vein. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there's, you know, legitimate data that actually says that, there's less thrombosis, I get the theoretical risk, but I completely agree that it sometimes is a little bit harder to retrieve in that situation. Yeah, I tend to go slow at first, and then the last bit is a fast push. Um, just to, I tell the fellows, like, if it's jumping, then you can control the sheath itself and pull it back or forward right before those secondary legs deploy. Um, and so it's a little difference, but yeah, it's getting that fine balance of like that pin pull, but. I mean, I think for both of us, I yeah. think we said that this is our filter of choice. You know, are, I think we've kind of discussed some of these features, but are there any, you know, other features about this filter in particular that make it your filter of choice? Yeah, I mean, again, I think the chance to do it over the wire is really important. The flexibility of sites, popliteal, jugular, femoral, um, and the low profile is really what sells me. It's just easier to make, you know, you're not worrying about dilators and pushing through, um, and it just makes the placement much easier. Um, personally. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think I, for all the same reasons, you know, ability to get this out quickly, the low profile, um, different accesses, and, um, and, and the data. Yeah. And the data speaks for itself. Yeah, it's a great filter, safe, and, you know, I'm, overall, it's my go-to. Um, so, Dr. Varadi, it's really great having this discussion, and uh, I want to thank the audience for uh, being here with us and having, uh, being a part of this, this discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me, and it's been uh, educational and informative. Uh, again, thanks.